Good morning, everyone. I'm very, very proud to uh, welcome you for the first, yes, it's actually the first DM Innovation Podcast. So today, uh, I'm Philippe Salah, CEO and founder of Dental Mentoring. I'm co-hosting this uh, um, a podcast with Serge Daan, one of the founder of Orthodontist and one of the founder of OrthoUp Network in, uh, in France. Hi, guys. Yeah. Uh, today, we are welcoming uh, so our first guest for, for, this, uh, for this podcast. Uh, Dr. Alfred Griffin, Lightforce CEO, founder of Lightforce in 2015, right? Alfred? 2015. Yep. 2015. Let me give you a quick intro about Lightforce. Lightforce is a cutting edge technology. I will look, you know what? I will even give up on my notes because I know you very well, Alfred. <laughs> so Lightforce is one of the cutting edge technologies that is transforming the ortho. You know, everybody use braces. You can still use braces, but on a far more customized predictable way by 3D printing them. So Lightforce is currently a fully digital AI driven solution that allow orthodontists to predictably um, design treatment plans through traditional ortho setup driven by ortho, which is uh, uh, driven by uh, artificial intelligence. Then based on that, they design customized braces and they 3D print these braces, not aligners, braces guys and based on that they deliver a complete set of uh, braces to the orthodontist which then will be able to provide an outstanding result what are the claims of flight force far more predictability convenience to the doctor because predictability reduce treatment time of course and, and and breakage and failures and all what we are trying to avoid and we will through this podcast try to go through in detail we are not there to be nice or not nice we are agnostic you know dental mentoring we are there to get info and to go deep into question serge as an orthodontist will really go to full clinical questions so serge everything you feel that you need to ask to alfred please do it as a European, you probably have different questions than an American guy. So, Alfred, welcome on the, on this show. I think I know you since I would say seven or eight years. You came in the inception of Lightforce to me. Um, please come back to me and come back to us and try try to tell us the story of Lightforce. What inspired you? How did you get to to this uh, brilliant idea? Yeah. Well, first, thanks for having me on, fully. This is uh, a true honor. And yes, you, you and I have known each other for quite a while. You were one of the people that I was told knows what they're talking about when it comes to, to braces design uh, from Harmony and all your past experiences as an engineer. So uh, you, you've seen the story yourself up close in person. But, you know, this all started really back in residency when it was very clear that there was a value to digital orthodontics where you can upload a case, an STL file to a liner software and do a better job for the patient. You can control the angulation of every tooth, the vertical position. You can look at the Bolton discrepancy, figure out how much IPR you need to do. Just really understand how that puzzle is gonna to come together for that patient. And the problem that I had as, as a resident, and that's when we met when I was a resident, is that the only output you had was a clear liner at the time. And for me, that was a problem because 80% of my cases were braces patients, um, especially in the team market. And so, the need was quite obvious is that we need to apply technology to solve this problem so that we can do a better job for patients and uh and run more efficient practices and so um that that was really the origin of the story and you know like i say all the time this is not a brilliant idea this is brilliant execution by some very talented uh orthodontists uh, and, I, and i'm talking about our customers as well because that's where we get most of our feedback and, and from the engineers here as well. Feedback means evolution of the product. How oh, you, you feel Lightforce is co today compared to when you started? Wow, well, w when I started, I think that's right around the time I met you and I got some feedback from you as well. <laughs> I remember. <laughs> Philippe, you're, you're nothing if you're not a realist. So um, the, you know the product has evolved, um, yeah. but we had to start somewhere. And that's that's one of the tough things uh, when you're building something is uh, you don't you shouldn't get graded by the the y axis but you should get graded by the slope how fast do you innovate and I think one of the catalysts for us to innovate as quickly as we have has been our tight relationship with our community and so I give our, our community the users more credit than than anyone here at the company for uh, accelerating us to where we are today and as far as some may think we have come we're still in the early innings of this 
I, uh, I have two questions for you because it's very interesting uh, what you said and uh, I'd like to know uh, were you inspired by uh, aligners and by uh, digital treatment? Uh, did you steal this idea from the, uh, the ClinCheck for example or for, uh, from uh, other companies? Uh, what, what did did bring, wh how uh, did you have this idea of bringing uh, a setup to uh, to the braces? Absolutely, Serge. That's a great question. And to, uh, this is an idea that I thought was pretty obvious, and it turns out it was pretty obvious. I even had some of our users say, hey, I actually one of our users, um, uh, David Sarver, brought me a paper, and he basically described this concept 25 years ago. But technology of the day had not caught up to a point where this was uh, able to be executed into a, a clinically efficacious product. Uh, 3D printing, it couldn't print ceramic. It could only print uh, polycarbonates. Um, software was not sophisticated enough to where this uh, could be cloud-based and, and scalable. And uh, there had been attempts at stuff like this, but it involved welding injection molded parts together or it involved um, you know, robots bending wires, which had a lot of limitations as well. And so the analogy I use, and I, I just learned this pretty recently, is that aligners were invented, actually, Philippe, do you, when, when were aligners invented, to your knowledge? Um, so far, far before Invisalign, uh, aligners was yeah. used on a very artisanal way uh, back in the 80s. Now Invisalign um, put them to years? the scale yeah. level. Yeah, to the scale yeah. level in 1998, but yeah. customized treatment were, were, were invade, invented. I would say uh, the the first big guy was Incognito, Doctor Vishman uh, from yeah. Incognito, which yeah. was already doing treatment planning with setups and uh, and and etc. So I didn't know about about that, but I, that makes a ton of sense. The story I just learned from another orthodontist is that. Uh, there's a guy, Dr. Kessling, in 1946 that came wow. out with something called the Positioner. You guys have heard of the Positioner. I'm sure many of your audience have heard of yeah, the Positioner. Yeah. And it, it turned into a, a company called TP Orthodontics. Yes. And what they did is basically, and basically it's a connected aligner, and they would take stone, Yellowstone models and cut the teeth and move them in, in small stages and use segmental positioners to get clear, uh, essentially clear aligner workflow. But it wasn't scalable. And I think that's what uh, Align Technologies really solved in 98 was the application of 3D printing technology and software to make clear aligners scalable where you're not cutting stone teeth. And so I would argue that what we're doing at Lightforce is that same application of modern 3D print technology and software to an old problem, pr uh, product and a problem to make it scalable. Alfred, you, you told us about your community and uh, the feedback you receive from orthodontists. And, uh, how long have you been using this this feedback and uh, how many orthodontists uh, are parts of uh, this uh, community and giving you feedback on your products? Well, it started um, quite small. Um, my dad's an orthodontist, so whether he wanted to or not, he had to um, <laughs> use the product. Um, but it, it grew quite rapidly and it started at AAO 2019 when we did our first beta launch. And we knew we could only take 20 new orthodontists and uh, those orthodontists, while nobody jumped all in, I think you know we were very upfront with people saying this is a new technology. We actually, we only sold them. We limited every doctor to two cases. We just wanted to get some early feedback. And what I think grew, made, made them so attached to the, to the uh, company was that the theory made 100% sense. This is not something that's hard to understand um, that a fully custom bracket should make you more efficient. Um, this is the first technology ever where the, the whole bracket is fully custom, where you have a custom base and a custom slot angulation that takes tooth anatomy as a variable for accuracy and bond strength out of the equation. That in theory should make a ton of sense. And in the early stages, software was limited, the materials were a little bit limited, and uh, but we still saw great results, but we saw areas of improvement as well. And when they saw how fast that we moved and how fast we pivoted and, and, and made progress, I think that was one of the things that helped the company Lightforce earn trust with that community and, and made them um, made that flywheel really robust with, with the community and the company. To follow up, uh, I will have two questions. Um, 
based on what you just said at the beginning, very early, few cases by doctors, etc. What do you feel were your biggest failure at that time and your biggest success? I know how hard is it to create companies, and I, and I had and I regret so many things on DM uh, on dental monitoring, and and we had also great success, and but. What you, would you advise to other people who go in entrepreneurship, who try to create their own companies? Uh, what would be your advice? So, so I'm happy to talk about uh, what I would consider our biggest failure. But the, the, the biggest piece of advice I would give is know your customer and make them your focus the entire time. It's actually our third core value at Lightforce is customer obsession. Um, Every decision we make at the company goes through the lens of, is this good for customers? Is this good for patients? And I, I think that actually follows on to, to your other question, what has been our biggest failure? Our biggest failure was in 2020, uh, we had started to gain some market traction after the beta, we started to move into a, a full launch. And coming out of AAO, we had uh, four technicians to help set the cases up. We didn't have the, the suite of tools we have today uh, that help automate some of that stuff. And we had, we under predicted demand. It was exciting at first, but it turned into a problem. And so we had to, we, we actually, it, it got as bad as we had 50 day wait times for setups. Now, Serge, would that work days. for any? Yeah, yeah 50. 50 days. Not 15, 50. No, five, five, zero. And okay. so once, once, we saw that turning into what would likely be the case in terms of like we project 50 day uh, lead times in in two months like that was the, the way things were going. We, we made the decision to call all of our customers that that we could not serve that would have any more than a four day lead time. And we said we need to uh, we, we can't help you in these cases. And uh, we decided to not only refund the money for the lab fee, but also give customers $350 as an inconvenience fee to their patients. Now, Philippe, you, you started companies before. Uh, you can probably imagine what that conversation was like with, with the board. Terrible. 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 Yeah. It's, uh, it's, uh, it, was, it, it happened to us a, a pretty similar thing, but what, what we did at that time, uh, when it, I'm, I'm thinking about Harmony at the time, we, mm -hmm. we had quotas. So we, we, we created quotas, that many cases per week, that many cases per month, and we were never uh, going up these quotas at the beginning to avoid uh, this type of, uh, of problem. But we had to learn yeah. in the bad way, a bit like you did. We, we had to go to a quota system for a period of time as well until we got um, our, our organization in Costa Rica up and running. Um, and, okay. and that really unlocked, unlocked the, uh, it helped us get back to a 48 hour lead time on, on digital cases. Um, but that was, hours today. yeah, under 48 hours today. Um, and, and that, that's always been the goal. Um, and actually, and there's actually opportunity to improve that, um, in, in the coming year. I imagine some of our auditor will understand already the concept, but can you go in detail about what is a process for the doctor, for the patient, mm -hmm. go even, uh, in some detail for the manufacturing process that, um, everybody is really clear for the rest of the conversation. Yeah, absolutely. We get that question all the time. It's, it's actually very simply understood. It's the same workflow as, as for clear aligners uh, for, for an office, the workflow. You, get a, you take a scan of the patient. Typically, you take a down payment as well. And then you see the patient back for a 30 to 45 minute visit where they bond light force braces uh, or, or you use the same period of time to bond clear liner attachments. Uh, and, and typically, this, this bonding appointment is primarily driven by your staff. Now, obviously the staff need to be trained and, and, uh, and know what they're doing, but this can in the US be, be delegated quite efficiently. Um, and, then, and then you're off and running. Unlike with traditional braces though, you typically extend the duration between visits from you know, four to six weeks to eight to, to 12. Actually, I just got an email this morning from a, uh, one of our all-in users who's also uh, just started using DM for all of his cases. He's going to four months now. Uh, with his okay. first wire due, due to DM technology. Oh, great. Um, I, I need yeah. to call him. <laughs> yeah. But otherwise, it's a similar workflow to clear aligners. 
Yeah, similar workflow means uh, you see the patient, you scan, you take photographs, you your radiographs, then mm -hmm. you prescribe, you, you make some kind of prescription uh, and you do the lab work and then uh, give us back a project. Uh, I am correct with that. Yeah, and then we validate it. Uh, how, how does it work for you? One of the key differences between, that's tough for, for new users to, to comprehend is that with light force, there really is no prescription. The prescription is where do you want the teeth to go? You don't th you think of the prescription in terms of the teeth, not necessarily the braces anymore. Because remember, there there is no essential uh, prescription to the bracket. It's where do, where are the teeth going to go? So um, you know, one of the questions that we commonly ask residents is you know what prescription for braces do you use in your practice? And they might say Roth, MBT, Andrews, whatever. Uh, and then we ask them what prescription do you use for your clear aligners? And, and some of them will have some interesting answers, but but the smart ones will say, we don't have a prescription for our clear aligners. Why is that? Well, my answer is that the only logical conclusion for why we don't have, pres why we have prescriptions with braces at all is due to manufacturing limitations. Otherwise mm -hmm. we would wanna have no prescription at all. We would wanna do what's best for that individual patient. And uh, it comes to my mind, another question. Um, do you do you put uh, it's a, it's a very clinical question. Mm -hmm. I, I apologize, Philip. Uh, do you put compensations uh, in your braces, in your brackets, customers' brackets, uh, for the anterior posterior uh, problems? For example, when you put elastics, uh, orthodontists know you have to put more uh, torque on the upper incisors, or some things like that. Do you uh, plan this in your in your brackets? It's a great question, Serge. The product has been out for three years, and I would tell you that this is an evolving subject. Actually, we're going to talk about this quite a bit at Light Force Future out in San Diego next week. Uh, but yes, is the answer. So we know that the slot is going to have exactly four degrees of slot play if you put a 1725 and an 018 slot. Now, why do we know that? And why is there so little variability? It's because there's not a, a mold. There's no injection molding here. The the bracket is formed from an STL file. An STL file does not wear down, it's a piece of software. Um, so it's gonna be the same thing predictably every time. Um, but there is that level of overcompensation. People, some put in, if, if they know they're gonna finish in a 1725, okay, great, and you really want the, the teeth to be at a certain torque, maybe you add four degrees to that torque on the teeth because you, you do the math and know there's four degrees of slot play and you're gonna end up in a 1725. So that's the next level of thinking and strategy in, in setting up a light plan. I'll give you another example. Um, if you have a very rotated upper right canine uh, and, and you want to make sure it rotates all the way around, we, we, these are twin braces. So typically people, we don't, people do seal ties sometimes, but you shouldn't have to. Usually people will over rotate another three degrees to make sure that happens all the way. But it's the same philosophy we use with clear aligners. Clear liners obviously don't track all the way. No, no um, it's not. It's not a hundred percent. Yeah, it's, it's certainly not a hundred percent, especially in the vertical dimension. Um, whereas with light force, there's far less overcompensation, but still some, and you need to be an orthodontist to really comprehend where those are overcompensation should be. And I'd also say the script is still being written on that. We're still actively learning. So as a non-orthodontist, I would I would summarize this, and you tell me if I'm, my summary my summary is good. You apply the same mechanics that you would apply for a, a tweed bracket, but because you know that the bra the braces themselves are far more precise in their design and position, you overcompensate far more, far less. Sorry. So you 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 don't put 15 degrees of additional torque just because you no. you feel that the sl slot play is is 15 degree in, in error. Exactly. To a large extent, you're going to get what you put in, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. And so, you know that that's also why I, I think of light force as a technology weapon that is best put in the right hands because you need to know what you're. You're, you're putting in. It, it emphasizes diagnosis and treatment planning. Just like with clear aligners, you need to start with the end in mind. Um, but if you don't know where you should end up, it, more can go wrong. So um, it, it is much more dependent on the skill set of the orthodontist. This is a, this replace, this is a, we were building the best paintbrush, but you still need to be the artist.
And for that, do you uh, integrate uh, CBCTs uh, as radiographs? Is it mandatory to use a CBCT or do you make setups uh, only about, uh, from STL files? So today, uh, CBTs, CBCTs are not mandatory, um, but you can expect us to, to make a push on that here this year. Okay. Uh, they, they will not be required, but they will likely be um, Recommended. helpful in, in the diagnosis and setup. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what's uh, what's the difference between you? Can you explain us uh, for for those who don't know your product very well uh, from Lightforce and, for example, Sure Smile? Because for for you, uh, I think uh, braces are custom based, custom made, and uh, but not the wires. Uh, if I correct me, if I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. And for Sure Smile, it's quite the opposite. Wouldn't it be more simple to customize wires? Great question. Um, so it's different. Um, you can you can have a smart bracket dumb wire or dumb wire smart bracket as uh, one of our users recently explained it to me. Um, so the, the the key difference and why most people are going to a smart bracket over, over a smart wire is because of the, the workflow and the round tripping. So typically with a custom bent wire, you stick the braces on and you let a straight wire or a night tie wire get straight. And then you do a new scan um, that's going to take the teeth to the right position. So, so you're already round tripping from day yeah, one. Yeah. And, and then if you have to replace a bracket or, or bracket debonds in, in any one of those times, then um, you know, Charlie Tweed himself probably couldn't bend a 3D robotically bent wire uh, into the exact <laughs> position. Um, or you have to wait a period of time to get a wire sent back to you. So there's some Theoretically, it, it makes a lot of sense. The, the reason that we're seeing, um, we're, we're typically seeing people transition is because of the workflow benefits and, and the efficiency. So to, to that I understand better, you're saying more or less that in the moment, in the rare moment where you, the orthodontist need to really get back into control, means using their hands, using your technology will be far more easy because the wire is just a straight wire and they, they just need to do what they know since ever, which is a tiny bend. Yeah, you, you really shouldn't have to make any bends. But um, again, if, if you want to change something in the light plan, then you still have that power. You're still an orthodontist and you're working off of a straight wire. Uh, but truly, the other benefit is going going in a direct flight. Um, mm -hmm. from, from Boston to Paris in, in a direct flight versus making a round trip flight stopping in London or something first. And, and what I mean by that is when you get the, the bent wire, you're, you're backtracking in many cases. You're not going in, in the same direction the whole time. Yeah. Of course, of course. Because uh, the, the information is not programmed the same way between a, a, stock, a stock wire at that moment and when you, you switch to the short smile wire, you obviously... Okay, I get it. I get it now. Uh, you, you were speaking about debounds. So how do you, because all this precision makes sense only if you can, in case of debound sometime, really react appropriately that to, you don't lose the precision of the appliance. How do you manage that? Yeah, so again, one of the benefits of, of a fully custom bracket is you take tooth anatomy as a variable for bond strength out of the equation. Mm -hmm. Now, th that's, a, that's a big help. And actually, um, you know, indirect bonding is been around for a long time, even digital indirect bonding. Uh, but I think, as you know, it hasn't really taken off for, for braces. Um, I would argue that one of the linchpins to scaling indirect bonding in a practice is having a fully custom bracket. Um, and, and there are two reasons for that. One is it takes the var one variable out of the way, which is tooth anatomy. And the other is that it allows you to bond to any surface of the tooth. If you have a blocked out tooth, if imagine you had a blocked out lower incisor, which is very common, and you can only bond to the distal part. Um, you might do that with a stock bracket indirect bonding, but then you know you're going to have to make a bend or you have to reposition that bracket on the facial axis point or the middle of that tooth later on and drop down a wire that costs you extra appointments. With Light Force, you can actually put that into the base so that you never have to rebond that that bracket. Now it might look a little bit funny when you're when you're if, if, when you're first getting going because you'll see a bracket on the distal part of the tooth, but then you'll see the teeth all be perfectly aligned, and you say, "Okay, that made sense." Um, so, so there's there's that a, a part of it. Um, but then your point, Philippe, about you need to keep the braces on. Absolutely, that's a critical part of, of any solution. Um, and if you're not keeping the braces on, then you start to lose efficiency. Um, 
one of the challenges, uh, I would say one of our biggest challenges right now is that there's a, a little bit of training. It, it's hard to go from stock braces or even for that matter, going from um, indirect bonding stock braces to light force. People need to embrace change. You can't just do the same, same things you always did. And that's um, honestly probably more true for the staff that's bonding it than the doctor. Uh, from from a doctor point of view, it, ma it makes sense pretty quickly, but uh, you're you're using less cement than you typically would because remember the it's a perfect fit, mm -hmm. um, and you need to to you know there's a process where you butter them into the undercuts and, and the base, and uh, once you do that, you we act, we see far less debonds than with stock braces, uh, direct bonded stock braces. Some practices take to training faster than others, and um, in that process, they have to uh, not do some of the things they used to do and, and, and adopt new practices for, for bonding technique. And once they do, it turns into a very efficient workflow. And, and we see that with our, with our practices in the, in the data. Um, I know at, at DM, you guys are very data-driven and that's how we make uh, evolution to our product as well. So um, you're speaking about adoption, uh, Alfred. Uh, what is, uh, f first, let's say I'm an orthodontist, I'm um, in Alabama, I'm not David Sarver, which is using because I'm, seen it uh, through uh, Barry Benton and DM using. Um, I mean, Alabama, I want to use Lightforce. What is the process? How many courses I need to do? What is the education process to start? Or maybe no. And what would be your advice to start well and to scale the usage of Lightforce within a clinic? Yeah. Best advice I could give would be to uh, really take advantage of the resources uh, that, that we provide. So we would we would have a, a integration specialist come to your practice and help do some in-person training. But in addition to that, there are lots of videos that, that reinforce uh, good habits um, and, and good practices in terms of the bonding phase. Um, and, and I would really just double down on the educational content because um, there, there are some nuances that, that aren't as obvious uh, if you've only done stock braces in your practice. So there is no traditional certifications and stuff that we, we, we could have seen in other companies. There is a certification for light force assistance. I would absolutely go through that certification process. We've seen that be a huge step forward in terms of success, in, in terms of uh, reorders. We track reorders when someone orders a, a new bracket. We assume that means something debonded. And there's a huge correlation between people who've taken those courses and, and debond percentage. Okay. okay. I, I will let now Serge, because I'm the data guy, I'm the process guy, but really Serge, I have uh, many clinical questions to ask you. Please, Serge. Yeah. Um, you, you told us about the precision of the, the appliance and the, the braces, uh, but what, what about the durability of these braces? Uh, have you tested them for a long time? Um, the debonding is one, but the failure, the, the crackage, uh, can you explain us uh, about the, the process and uh, versus uh, metal braces, for example, uh, what does that mean? Yeah, great question, Serge. That's something that's evolved over time. Um, as Philippe knows, the, you know, we started in one place and, and, and you know, we, we've evolved quite a bit. Um, part of that evolution has been in the, uh, the translucency of the bracket. So we're actually able to achieve 3% denser uh, alumina than, than any other ceramic bracket in the market that we know of um, through, through a process. Now, what, what that does not mean is that light force braces are more durable than metal. That's not true. Metal braces are more durable. It's just a different material. It, it'll likely bend instead of fracturing. So the cost of a patient biting on a bracket is high. So how do we solve that? We use software. And, and we use indirect bonded turbo. So in light, within light plan, the, the software will detect automatically if an upper tooth is gonna bite on a lower bracket, either at the beginning of the case or at the end of the case. And if that's the case, then, then uh, the software will either lower the brackets to the right amount, uh, or if that's not possible for you know, some deep bites, then the software will recommend bite turbos uh, on, on the upper ones, upper threes, upper fours, five, six, and sevens. Um, and, and the doctor is very involved in that decision as well. And these bite turbos are custom made too? They are, they are custom made, but they are indirect bonded. Typically people use something like band lock or um, um, band yeah. cement to, to, mm -hmm. to put in there. And then, and then uh, an assistant typically will do this. And then once they're delivered, the bite is open just the right amount so that the upper teeth are roughly 800 microns away from hitting a lower bracket. 
Okay. Thank you. And uh, another question about the, the bracket. Um, what about the friction between the wire and the and the slot? Uh, yep. Because it's a it's a different material. Uh, so have you measured it? Uh, what what about the friction? We have. This is uh, the FDA actually requires this test. Uh, so we did measure it, and we found that uh, we are roughly one third less friction than ceramic brackets compared to metal braces. Metal braces have less friction. Um, but we do some chamfering in the density of, of the material. We've been able to reduce that somewhat compared to traditional ceramic braces. Uh, but it's the same material. This is a, a polycrystalline aluminum oxide. Uh, there's no polycarbonate in this at all, which is critical to maintaining the shape, avoiding creep. Uh, a lot of mechanical biomechanical reasons we would we want this material. Um, but um, it, it's solved simply by sliding, uh, doing sliding mechanics on a steel wire versus beta titanium. And, and typically you shouldn't need beta titanium anyway, because that's a, a wire, a metal we use for making bends. And we typically don't need to make a lot of bends with, with this product. So it, it's a perfect link for my last question. Last clinical, okay. clinical question is, uh, uh, how, uh, amount of, uh, reducing the, the finishing time, uh, could you give us, uh, do you have a percentage of uh, less appointment or less time treatment with uh, with light force braces? Do you have a study uh, or uh, data about that? So again, we're in our infancy in, in building this product, uh, but I can tell you across the board, if you talk to users, they will say there's a lot of efficiency. That's why they're using it. It's This is more expensive than, than stock braces um, by a factor of three to four. So uh, there has to be or else people wouldn't be using it. Uh, we just had our first retrospective clinical trial published in JCO actually this week. Uh, so kudos. Uh, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I, I, I can tell you what that uh, showed. It showed a 40, roughly 40, 45% reduction in the number of visits um, and, and the same Impressive. reduction in the treatment time. But the other interesting thing that it showed was um, a reduction in debonds. And actually the debonds started a bit higher and this is back in 2019. Uh, and, and then they were used to, uh, it, it was like six D-bonds per case and uh, tracking closer to two and a half now. Uh, and the other interesting finding was that 80% of the cases finished in nickel titanium wire, which would suggest that no wire bands were required. Yeah. And you would say that the, the, the bond filling, the D-bonds are far less now because of the expertise of your software place, in placing the, the bracket in a better position or is there is change in the material you you you, you used or what, what would, would be uh, the reason? There's some things that, that I think uh, we control and, and we own as a company and there are some things I think that are controlled by the practice and, and their familiarity with the product. Uh, but I think both of those things have been important over the last three years. So. Um, certainly the material science has improved around the bracket and I think the software has improved. Um, but I think one of the bigger driving forces has been that users with adoption become quite comfortable with the product and the workflow uh, and, and the staff does as well. Um, people typically focus on doctors um, initially, but it, there's so many stakeholders in a product like this where, where the workflow changes. I'm sure you, you know this all too well at DM. It's not just the doctor. It takes a lot of people uh, to, to make change successful and efficient. And so it, as the whole office gains, uh, improves their skill set around implementing Lightforce, um, as, as I'm sure they do with, with DM, then you start to see incredible efficiency. Yes, there's a learning curve, uh, like in every product, uh, I presume, uh, for, for Lightforce. Absolutely. Alfred, tell me, uh, innovation, part of your company since ever. Can you give us a little bit, if you, you are not disclosing, of course, too much things, but can you give us a bit more about your, uh, your, your, your roadmap? For example, the natural question would be, are you going to self-flagating? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, there, we believe there is a value in, in self-flagating um, in, in how you tie the wire in. Um, but I would take a step back and just say that we believe that there is a value in customizing everything that goes in the mouth. And uh, why? Because there is a clinical value to it for, for doctors. And, and more importantly, there's a value to patients. Uh, so, you know, 
we think there's there's more more room to grow on on the fixed appliance side, and that's our that's going to be our focus and, uh, in the coming uh, years. You you told uh, you talked about uh, dump wires earlier. Do you plan combining combining uh, smart braces and smart wires? I I wouldn't say no to anything at this point. Um, but I would tell you that that's not been something that's not been a huge ask from from users okay. that, that use Lightforce quite a bit. And and Lingual, okay. why not? Oh, uh, Lingual. Um, Lingual's tough. Uh, you probably know a thing or two about that. Uh, but um, I, I think right now that the Lingual market is is quite well served by some um, by some great companies. Um, okay, so you don't feel you don't feel that it's a move for the moment for Lightforce. Like I said, not not saying no to anything, mm. but but I, I um, you know, it, it's not our focus right now. And one more uh, difficult question. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, you only do, uh, and un only is not a bad thing, a uh, bad term. Uh, you only do uh, crystal braces, so ceramic bra braces. Uh, do you plan to do metal braces, maybe with a different technology? And why uh, were you focused on uh, ceramic braces? It's a great question. The reason we're focused on ceramic is because we're, we're kind of riding that wave uh, that aligners create of aesthetics and, and putting patients first. And, and there's a world we know from the aligner world that there's a world of patients that aren't getting treated with uh, orthodontics before because of the aesthetic concerns. So, so we want to focus on something that would be most aesthetic to uh, adults, but also to teens. And, and we're even seeing that in the later teen segments where uh, they don't want, want metal in the mouth. We're also seeing this in the rest of uh, general dentistry where there's now an aversion to, to metal in the mouth with, as it relates to amalgams or anything else. Um, and, and so we're, we know that, that ceramic polycrystal and alumina um, is one of the most biologically inert materials known to man. Um, and, and so it's a great uh, material from a biology point of view. Um, mechanically, it's also probably the best at retaining its shape. It's not gonna bend. Um, and especially if we can control uh, any any bracket tooth interferences, it's a great it's a great material for braces. So we really like uh, polycrystal and alumina as a material. We we believe it's the best, and we spent a lot of time uh, optimizing our our materials to to or our, our process to make that our product. Okay, and I'm sure there's a very interesting question for us a uh, european uh, orthodontist do you plan to uh, to sell your your products uh, in europe for, because for now it's focused on the us market and uh, do you have plans for uh, the rest of the world well we think there are world class orthodontists in europe that's that's an area we would love to be um, uh, we're right now focused on north america so us and canada and uh, we recently launched in australia new zealand Um, and, you know, I, I would tell you that, that Europe is likely going to be a focus here very shortly. Great. Oh, so well, great so you will start probably you. by Octo up. <laughs> great series of doctors. <laughs> no pressure. If, 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 you need, if you need a group to, to test and to have uh, feedback, uh, you have 60 doctors uh, at your service uh, doing that. <laughs> you will be our first call, Serge. <laughs> Thank you. I have one more question. Uh, it's about 3D printing uh, because, as you know, more and more uh, orthodontists have uh, 3D printers in their offices. Mm -hmm. And uh, do you think it would be uh, a way of expanding for your society to uh, design cases and braces and uh, provide 3D printers or um, 3D material to print uh, at your office and delegate the, the fabrication of the, of the products? It's a great question, Serge. Um, we've thought very hard about that. And, and any chance that we would have as a company to give doctors more control, that's something we're, uh, we're intent on, on giving. One of the limitations, though, that, that we found is that 3D printing braces is, is quite a industrial process to do it right. Um, and there's an investment that one would need to make in terms of capital equipment to scale quality control, scale traceability, and uh, get to the quality that, that you really need to make a clinically efficacious bracket uh, that probably wouldn't make sense to have in an office. Uh, beyond that, uh, 
you know, if you see the factory, you see that, that it's, these are not tiny printers and these are, you know, it's not just printing, but it's also the, the post-processing steps, the many, many post-processing steps that you need to maintain or get to this level of quality and density. Um, so I don't think today that's a reality uh, or something that I would recommend. I, I, any, any relationship we have with a customer, I would want them to win 51%, uh, us win 49%, but the, that's not something I would recommend to a customer today. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for um, that. I, um, I completely agree with you, Alfred. It's a predictability come by reliability and reliability come by industrial process most of the time. Yeah, I, I think too, because uh, my question was uh, maybe in the, in the future uh, with uh, pro the, the, the progress in the 3D printing technologies of materials. But for now, of course, uh, you have such a precise product and uh, it's a very uh, accurate and industrial process. And then if we move back to our offices, it could be not more than artisanal uh, and it's not gaining precision doing that. So thank you. So do you want to conclude on something, Alfred, that uh, you know, to inspire uh, our auditors on Lightforce? And where do you feel the, the, the future is, is going now? So I could not be more excited for the future of orthodontics. It actually feels a little bit like the, the Wild West, uh, as we say here in the U.S., in that uh, a lot of things are changing quickly. And I don't think it's a bold statement anymore to say that orthodontics as a specialty is going digital. Uh, we, we expect to be part of that story. Uh, I think dental monitoring is going to be part of that story as well. And, you know, people often think of, are starting to think of, of orthodontics through the lens of the patient and what the modern consumer experiences and any technology that provides value to the customers, uh, should be something that orthodontists, we as orthodontists really consider, uh, adopting, um, I think there's there's a lot of cool synergies that we're we still are, are, have left to discover. Um, some of the things I'm still learning, for example, are, are how Lightforce and, and DM work together well. Uh, we had a uh, I had a call with a doctor last week who said that one of the things that they they like about combining DM and Lightforce is when they have a debond or if they have a debond, patient chews on candy, rocks, whatever, uh, they know about it. They they come in and that's not. That used to be a doctor visit. Now it's a, a visit they can delegate because they can put a backup bracket that comes in a single tooth indirect bonding tray right back on the tooth and not have to drop a wire. And, and the, the assistant can do that. And so they can go right back into their mechanics versus having to place a stock bracket, drop a wire, or you know, mess around with that. So there are some synergies and efficiencies that I, I think we're going to discover and that are... Um, you know, a lot of it's going to rely on education uh, from from doctors that, that are that are doing this, and that's that's why we're excited to celebrate these pioneers that are adopting these technologies and teaching the rest of the world how to use them together. And I'm pretty convinced that um, within the next five to ten years, max, really, if ten years is I think it's even too far. That most of the cases will be digital. It means uh, I can't conceive in a in a, in a short term that a, a patient is not receiving a full digital treatment plan, whatever the appliance behind the scene, then it's placed on the patient, but it will need to have a very predictable uh, outcome. And for that, you need, you, you, you absolutely need a, a digital treatment plans and, and digital solution to follow them. I, I completely agree. I think that the definition of the standard of care in orthodontics is going to be defined over the next few years. That's why I think it's such an exciting time, Philippe. Alfred, Thank you so much for participating to this first po first po podcast. I really enjoyed it, and uh, I'm I'm really honored to have you. And uh, I wish to see you soon in US. Uh, Serge, thank you for hosting with me this this podcast, and uh, and I hope to have you again with me on the next interview. See you guys, and it was a great pleasure. Yeah, you thank you. This podcast on the GM website and on uh, all our channels. Thank you very much. <laughs>